Pathology Master. Myself, Dr. Bhagat Goswami, and I am the consultant pathologist. Hope you are all doing well. Sorry, I was not able to post the video for last uh, two weeks, but now I am back with a new video that is hemolytic anemia. So today we will discuss regarding the hemolytic anemia. So any topic should be start with learning objective. It's a good practice to start it start it with the index. So guys, in the today's lecture. a student or any participant should be able to understand what is hemolytic anemia then you should able to classify the hemolytic anemia you should be able to understand the basic pathogenesis of development of hemolytic anemia and you should be familiar with the peripheral smear findings in a case of hemolytic anemia and finally you should know the clinical features of hemolytic anemia as well so these are our learning objective now as per the new curriculum in the india Uh, as per the MCI in the new curriculum, the whole portion of pathology is divided into various competencies, right? So today we will cover the comp and the code for the pathology is given P A. So today we will cover competency number sixteen point one, sixteen point two, and the sixteen point six. So I will cover all these competencies. I will make you familiar with the definition, classification, and P S findings of hemolytic anemia, and I will cover some of the M C Qs as well. So first of all definition what is hemolytic anemia So guys the name itself suggest hemolysis means destruction of the red blood cell So in this condition there will be hemolysis of the red blood cell the RBC will get destroyed So because of destruction of the RBC you will lose your red blood cell and if your bone marrow is not functioning properly if it cannot compensate the loss then you can develop anemia So the main presentation of the hemolytic anemia is the anemia, right? So guys, whenever the hemolysis is mild, uh, if it is uh, mild, then bone marrow can comp compensate the loss. You know very well that any form of blood cell, starting from the white blood cell, platelets, red blood cells, all are form in your bone marrow. So whenever your RBC are get destroyed. they will be compensated the lost will be compensated by bone marrow bone marrow will produce more and more rbc to compensate the loss so in mild case you will not develop anemia you will not have any clinical presentation like in case of thalassemia minor right but if it is severe moderate to severe destruction is more then bone marrow cannot compensate and you can develop the clinical feature particularly in form of anemia right so in the moderate to severe case of hemolytic anemia you can develop anemia for example severe g6pd deficiency or thalassemia major so guys this is about the hemolytic anemia definition right okay normally in our body the life span of rbc is 120 days after 3 month your red blood cell will get old and it will be removed by spleen but in case of an hemolytic anemia the life span of rbc is reduced to less than 15 days right it will be around 15 to 20 days uh, so within the 15 days your red blood cell will get destroyed by the spleen instead of 120 days so the life span is shortened and you will develop the anemia okay so guys uh, now we will cover the pathogenesis of rbc destruction until now we have discussed the definition right so the pathogenesis as far as the pathogenesis is concerned the red blood cell destruction means hemolysis of the red blood cell can occur outside the vessel or within the vessel if it is within the blood vessel then it is known by the name intravascular hemolysis and if it is outside the vessel particularly in the spleen suppose if it is in the spleen then it is known by the name extravascular hemolysis so according to the site of rbc destruction we can divide the hemolytic anemia into extravascular and intravascular category this is the traditional classification of hemolytic anemia so extravascular hemolysis occur in the spleen right it will occur in the spleen and it is the major mechanism for the rbc destruction in the most of the case the mechanism is extravascular hemolysis normally guys in our body whenever the rbc are getting old suppose uh, it covers its life span for 120 days then after 120 days rbc will get old 
and they will be removed by reticulo endothelial cell of our spleen and bone marrow right it will be removed by reticulo endothelial cell this normal destructive mechanism is exaggerated in case of an hemolytic anemia right i will show you it in the diagram see normally what happen whenever your rbcs are getting old it will be phagocytosed by the reticulo endothelial cell of your spleen and bone marrow so that what happen your red blood cell will will be destructed into heme plus globin right this globin will be reutilized they will be broken into amino acid and they will be reutilized for alpha and beta chain synthesis of new hemoglobin right so it will recycled and this broken heme will further broken down into the iron and protoporphyrin right this iron will be carried out to the bone marrow through the trans transferrin protein this is a carrier protein for iron it will carry it to the bone marrow and it will store as an iron store right it will get store second it can get converted into protoporphyrin the protoporphyrin which will also be released and this protoporphyrin will get converted into bilirubin and finally it will get converted into unconjugated bilirubin so guys in extravascular hemolysis you will have the more iron store and the marker for detecting the iron storage is the serum ferritin so as your iron store is increase your serum ferritin level will get increase in the extravascular hemolysis second in the extravascular hemolysis that particularly happen in the spleen you will have increase unconjugated bilirubin so you will have the unconjugated bilirubinemia in your blood okay now what happened to that unconjugated bilirubin guys it will get conjugated into the liver right so after the conjugation it will get converted into bilirubin glucuronide it will excrete it in the bile and finally through the bile duct and gall bladder it will goes into the intestine in the intestine bacterial enzymes will act upon the bilirubin glucuronide and it will convert the bilirubin bilirubin glucuronide into the urobilinogen so it will get converted into urobilinogen and stercobilinogen this stercobilinogen will get excreted via feces while this urobilinogen will absorb through the intestine and again through the enterohepatic circulation it will excreted in the urine through the kidney so it will undergo enterohepatic circulation and it will get excreted in the urine so normally you can have 2 to 4 mg per day urobilinogen in your urine so we can say that in extravascular hemolysis you will have increase fecal stercobilinogen and increase urinary urobilinogen urobilinogen in the urine will get increase so this is about the extravascular hemolysis right this is the basic pathogenesis of how extravascular hemolysis occur so main site of destruction is the spleen okay all right now we will see the intravascular rbc destruction the second mode of destruction is the intravascular hemolysis now in this uh, condition the rbcs are destroyed in the circulation it will get destroyed within your blood vessel in the circulation so it is given the name intravascular hemolysis here the destroyed rbc will directly release the hemoglobin and it will filter through the kidney and will get excreted in the urine that is known by the name hemoglobin urea so the hallmark of intravascular hemolysis is presence of hemoglobin urea and whenever you have long standing hemoglobin it can get converted into hemosiderin so the renal tubular epithelial cells can be studied with the hemosiderin which can be detected in the urine as well and the special stain for detection of the hemosiderin is the pulse prussian blue reaction which stain the hemo hemosiderin as a blue colored all right so guys this is about the intravascular hemolysis so we have covered the basic pathogenetic mechanism for the extravascular and intravascular destruction now you can very well understand that uh, extravascular hemolysis occur in the spleen and bone marrow particularly by the reticulo endothelial cells and the intravascular hemolysis will occur in the circulating blood within the vessel so we will see the basic difference between the extravascular and intravascular hemolysis in the somewhat detail so the site of hemolysis as we have discussed the extravascular happen in the spleen and the intravascular hemolysis occur within circulating blood okay 
Now guys what happen in case of an extra vascular hemolysis if you remember the figure if you remember this chart then you can see that broken rbc will ultimately releases the iron and which gets stored in the bone marrow so your serum ferritin level will get increase which reflect your iron store bone marrow storage so your storage will increase in the extra vascular hemolysis and in the serum you will have increase unconjugated bilirubin as well so in the extra vascular hemolysis you will have increase serum ferritin and increase unconjugated bilirubin level which is not much elevated in intravascular hemolysis it is much elevated in extra vascular hemolysis okay all right now in the intravascular hemolysis if you remember you will have hemoglobin urea so in the urine hemoglobin is present in the intravascular hemolysis which is not seen in extra vascular hemolysis okay second point guys uh, in the intravascular hemolysis you will have more rbc destruction and hemoglobin is getting released in the blood so this released hemoglobin can get converted into methylalbumin so in the serum methylalbumin level can be increased in intravascular hemolysis which is not seen in extravascular and because of the destruction of rbc because of released hemoglobin your plasma will also will have the more hemoglobin right so plasma hemoglobin is positive in case of an intravascular hemolysis while it is negative in extravascular hemolysis okay now further important difference is about the serum ldh now this serum ldh is a marker for in general hemolytic anemia why i am telling you see guys a red blood cell is not having enough oxygen uh, not having enough mitochondria so they will do the anaerobic glycolysis right and so whenever you so it having the more it is having the more level of lactate dehydrogenase right because it is doing anaerobic glycolysis so whenever you have destruction of the rbc the ldh from the red blood cell will get released right suppose this is your rbc it contain the lots of uh, lactate dehydrogenase enzyme whenever these rbcs are broken down this ldh will get released into your blood right so if your ldh level is increased you will have the hemolytic anemia and you know very well that in in intravascular hemolysis there is a mark rbd destruction within the circulation so ldh level is much more elevated in intravascular hemolysis while it is only slightly increase in case of an extravascular hemolysis okay obviously urine hemosiderin is present in intravascular type it is not present in extravascular type as we have discussed because hemoglobin urea is seen only in intravascular hemolysis okay examples of extravascular hemolysis are sickle cell and thalassemia and the examples of intravascular hemolysis is g6pd deficiency and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea they are the classical example of uh, extravascular and intravascular hemolysis okay extravascular hemolysis occur in the spleen and bone marrow so in the spleen and liver you can have increased iron level right but it is not elevated in intravascular hemolysis now below here is the figure of hemoglobin urea this is your normal urine right this is the normal pale yellow colored urine but if you see this diagram it is a pink colored right the color of urine has been changed to pink so it is a case of hemoglobin urea so this is an example of intravascular hemolysis you can see the hemoglobin urea right all right so guys uh, we have discussed about the definition of uh, hemolytic anemia uh, we have covered the basic pathogenetic mechanism of the hemolytic anemia and according to which we have divided the hemolytic anemia into extravascular and intravascular hemolysis we have seen the basic difference as well now we will see the clinical feature of hemolytic anemia in general clinical features so as we have discussed uh, there will be hemolysis of the rbc so your rbc will get lost right and sometime bone marrow cannot compensate uh, for the lost rbc because sometime what happen in the mild case bone marrow can compensate the loss but if you have the moderate to severe degree of rbc hemolysis then the capacity of bone marrow is no more and they can no more able to do the erythropoiesis and so they cannot compensate the lost rbc and you will develop the anemia 
so in the anemia the patient will complain of fatigue weakness mainly and in the severe case they can complain the dyspnea as well dyspnea on exertion and if you examine the patient clinically then then the patient will pale particularly conjunctiva will totally pale here you can see that conjunctiva is pale so pallor will be the first clinical manifestation right and the patient will complain fatigue and weakness okay now as we have discussed in the hemolytic anemia particularly in the extravascular hemolysis the rbc are getting destroyed right and the protoporphyrin is also released which is get converted into bilirubin so the patient will have jaundice they will have yellow colored sclera and the yellow colored urine so you can see that sclera is totally yellow because the patient will develop jaundice bilirubin level will get increase in the hemolytic anemia in the extravascular hemolysis particularly your spleen will get enlarged because the spleen is doing the function of removing of the red blood cell right they are doing the function of destruction of rbc so you will have the spleen omegaly okay sometime because bilirubin get concentrated in the bile you can develop gallstone pigmented gallstone can be seen and finally sometime particularly in case of a sickle cell anemia uh, you can develop thromboembolism in hemolytic anemia right whenever there is endothelial injury you are at a risk for thromboembolism so because of thromboembolism patient can develop leg ulcers and because of heart failure and because of anemia patient can develop dyspnea and tachycardia dyspnea means difficulty in breathing and tachycardia means increased heart rate so these are the clinical features of hemolytic anemia so guys uh, until now we have discussed the classification pathogenesis and basic difference between the two types of hemolytic anemia we have discussed clinical feature as well so guys extravascular and intravascular hemolysis is the traditional classification now the hemolytic anemia is mainly classified into the two variety either it can be from the birth you can have hemolytic anemia from the birth because of some enzyme deficiency that is known by the name hereditary hemolytic anemia and the second variety of hemolytic anemia which is acquired later on in the life that is known by the name acquired hemolytic anemia so we can divide the hemolytic anemia into the hereditary and acquired hemolytic anemia this is the another type of classification of hemolytic anemia i am not talking regarding extravascular or intravascular that is the classification according to pathogenetic mechanism here we are classifying according to whether it's hereditary or acquired later on in the life so it can be hereditary or acquired further this hereditary hemolytic anemia that is present from the birth it can be divided into five subtypes the first type subtype is defect in the rbc membrane second there can be defect in the globin synthesis globin chain is present in the hemoglobin third variety is you can have enzyme deficiency of the glycolytic pathway from the birth fourth you can have enzyme deficiency in the of the pentose phosphate pathway and finally you can have enzyme deficiency of the red blood cell nucleotide metabolism so these five are the subtypes of hereditary hemolytic anemia now acquired hemolytic anemia so this type of hemolytic anemia is acquired later on in the life and it can divide it into seven subtypes right the first one is it can be immune hemolytic anemia it can be fragmentation syndrome it can be paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin urea it can be due to drugs and chemical it can be due to some of the thermal injuries it can be due to infection or it can be from the other causes acquired later on in the life now we will see each category in the detail with the example right and guys uh, i will explain all the causes of hemolytic anemia in my subsequent lecture in the future right here hereby i am just giving you the overview so we will start with the first category that is defect in the red blood cell membrane the example of such variety is hereditary spherocytosis elliptocytosis stomatocytosis and acanthocytosis these four are example of defect in the red blood cell membrane from the birth now you can have defect in the globin chain synthesis the classical example is sickle cell anemia and the thalassemia 
or sometimes unstable hemoglobin disease. Now these two are the major burden in the developing country like India. It is a major cause of hemolytic anemia in the India. Okay. You can have enzyme deficiency of the glycolytic pathway from the birth. The examples are pyruvate kinase deficiency and the hexokinase deficiency. Sometimes you can have enzyme deficiency of the pentose phosphate pathway. The example is G6PD. It's a most important MCQ. Here you will have enzyme deficiency of the pentose phosphate pathway. You can have enzyme deficiency of the red blood cell nucleotide metabolism. Particular example is pyrimidine 5 nucleotidase deficiency. Okay. So these are all about the hereditary hemolytic anemia example. Now we will see the example of acquired hemolytic anemia. That we will start with immune hemolytic anemia. The example of immune hemolytic anemia is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Hemolytic disease of newborn or mismatch blood transfusion reaction. Okay. Second variety of acquired hemolytic anemia is fragmentation syndrome. The example of which is hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, DIC or prosthetic cardiac valve. Drugs and chemical also can cause hemolytic anemia. The drugs causative for the hemolytic anemia is primaquine, oxidant drug and dapson. Particularly they will do the hemolysis in G6PD deficiency. This G6PD deficient patient cannot uh, withhold the oxidative stress and so they will develop hemolysis following these drugs. Okay, sometimes infection also can cause hemolytic anemia, particularly clostridia, botanolysis, and cholera. The other examples are vitamin E deficiency, nitrate, nitrites, and naphthalene intake, excessive intake. So, guys, this is all about the classification of hemolytic anemia. So whenever you are asked in the exam regarding the classification of hemolytic anemia, then you have to give it in a two way. The first is extravascular and intravascular as per the pathogenesis. And second one is according to if hemolytic anemia acquired from the birth or it is acquired later on in the life. So hereditary or acquired hemolytic anemia, that is the two main classification of hemolytic anemia. And you have to give example of each category, right? All right, so this is about the classification of hemolytic anemia. All right, guys, now we will see the compensatory mechanism to the hemolysis. Suppose if hemolysis occur in your blood, then what happened? As we have discussed, the bone marrow will do the compensation for the lost hemoglobin. So bone marrow will function more and they will increase the erythropoiesis. The red blood cell production process is known by the name erythropoiesis. So you will have increased erythropoiesis in your bone marrow so that oxygen carrying capacity is maintained and you will not develop anemia. So guys, as far as the compensatory mechanism is concerned, in the bone marrow, you will have the increased erythropoiesis. So we can say that you will have erythroid hyperplasia in your bone marrow. Normally in the bone marrow, myeloid to erythroid ratio is 3 gem 1. It's 3 is to 1. But here, the more red blood cell will produce, there will be more erythropoiesis. So you will have increased erythropoiesis. So this ratio will get revert. And you will have 1 gem 3. Sorry, you will have 1 gem 3 ratio instead of 3 is to 1. So you will have the erythroid hyperplasia, right? You will have the erythroid hyperplasia in your bone marrow. But in case, in severe case, as we have discussed in moderate to severe case, the bone marrow is not able to compensate the lost RBC and you will develop anemia because most of the normal blast will die because of ineffective erythropoiesis and they will get removed through the process of apoptosis. So in the severe case, you will develop anemia because erythropoiesis is no more effective in compensate the low, compensate for the lost RBC. So you will develop erythroid hyperplasia. Okay. Second, guys, you will have increased number of reticulocytes as well because it is the it is a premature form of red blood cell. It is just the one stage above the formation of fully mature red blood cell. So your reticulocyte count will get increased because the more normal blast were released into your blood right so you will have increased number of normal blast in your peripheral smear see guys 
द बोन मेरो विल डू द कंपनसेशन फॉर द लॉस्ट आर बी सी दे आर प्रोड्यूसिंग मोर एंड मोर रेड ब्लड सेल्स राइट सो दिस प्री मेच्योर फॉर्म ऑफ रेड ब्लड सेल प्री मेच्योर फॉर्म्स आर अर्ली नॉर्मोप्लास्ट इंटरमीडिएट नॉर्मोप्लास्ट लेट नॉर्मोप्लास्ट ऑल दैट प्री मेच्योर फॉर्म्स कैन गेट रिलीज इन टू द ब्लड प्री मेच्योरली राइट सो इन केस ऑफ एन हिमोलिटिक एनीमिया इन द पेरीफरल स्मियर नाउ वी आर टॉकिंग रिगार्डिंग द पेरीफरल स्मियर फाइंडिंग्स इन हिमोलिटिक एनीमिया सो इन द पेरीफरल स्मियर यू विल हैव इंक्रीज नंबर ऑफ नॉर्मोप्लास्ट एंड दैट इज बिकॉज ऑफ कंपनसेटरी एक्शन ऑफ बॉन मेरो सो इन द पेरीफरल स्मियर यू विल सी द इंक्रीज नंबर ऑफ नॉर्मोप्लास्ट राइट एंड यू विल हैव इंक्रीज रेटिकुलोसाइड काउंट विच इज which is not seen in peripheral smear retic reticulocyte cannot be stained with our routine stain so it is seen as a blue color in the red blood cell which is called as an polychromatic rbc right so these are the normoplast you can see that in the blood normoplast are getting increased this is the normoplast right they are the late normoplast so normoplast will increase in your peripheral smear in case of an hemolytic anemia and you will have the blue colored rbc that is known by the name polychromasia so these two are the main peripheral smear finding in case of an hemolytic anemia and now because of destruction of the red blood cell you can see the various uh, shape of red blood cell you can see various forms of red blood cell according to the type of hemolytic anemia you can see sickle cell cystocyte target cell helmet cell etc we will see each cell in the detail all right so first we will start with the spherocytes suppose if you have defect in the rbc membrane if you have hereditary spherocytosis or you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia then you will have the spherocytes in your blood in the right side diagram you can see that spherocytes are smaller than routine red blood cell right they do not have central pallor you know very well that rbc is having central pallor but in spherocytes the central pallor is not seen and they are intensely stained totally pink color so this is the spherocytes it can be seen in spherocytosis and autoimmune hemolytic anemia okay second form of red blood cell that is seen in hemolytic anemia is cystocytes this is particularly seen in case of a severe hemolytic anemia that is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia burns or cardiovascular processes patient in this condition what happen you will have the helmet triangle or crescent shape broken red blood cell this is the broken rbc this is known by the name cystocytes right it is having the projection over the surface so cystocytes also can be seen in hemolytic anemia third cell that can be seen in hemolytic anemia and which is the most important one is the target cell is the most important mcq are frequently asked in the exam these target cells are particularly seen in hemoglobinopathy like that of sickle cell and thanisemia it can be seen in splenectomy and obstructive jaundice as well so if you have the sickle cell or thalassemia like disease you will have the target cell in your peripheral smear target cell looks like an bull's eye appearance if i zoom this figure then you can see that this is the target cell right the target cell is having the bull's eye appearance it has the unstained cytoplasm between the central and peripheral ring so you can see that there is a peripherally stained portion and centrally stained portion and in between these two you will have the unstained cytoplasm portion so this is the target cell it is having the unstained cytoplasm between the central and peripheral ring it is having bulls eye appearance and is classically seen in sickle cell and thalassemia just remember this cell guys it can be asked in your competitive exam they will put this photo and they will ask you for the diagnosis okay bur cell a fourth variety is bur cell it is having the projections over the surface it is seen in severe hemolytic anemia particularly it is seen in uremia chronic renal failure right these are the bur cell you can see that small projections over the surface is seen okay fifth variety is white cell in the hemolytic anemia it is particularly seen in g6pd deficiency if you have the g6pd deficiency then the patient cannot uh, withstand the oxidative stress and they will have denatured hemoglobin uh, which is hain's body it will get removed by the spleen and so you will have appearance like that rbc is bitten off 
you can see that rbc is beaten off right this is your byte cell rbc looks like an beaten so byte cell is seen in g6pd deficiency we will discuss it in detail whenever we are discussing g6pd deficiency okay the most important cell after target cell that is seen in the hemolytic anemia is sickle cell it is seen in the sickle cell anemia they are the name itself suggests they are the narrow elongated sickle sapped rbc they are having the pointed end and they are formed due to the deoxygenation they will they will form due to the deoxygenation when whenever the oxygen concentration is lost right when you have less oxygen the rbcs will get converted into sickle cell class classically seen in sickle cell anemia most important mcq all right so guys this is all about the hemolytic anemia i have covered the definition pathogenesis classification of hemolytic anemia and finally i have discussed the peripheral smear finding of hemolytic anemia again i am summarizing of the peripheral smear finding in general in the peripheral smear in case of an hemolytic anemia you will see the polychromatic rbc you will see the normoblast in your peripheral smear which will get increase normally up to 2% normoblast can be seen in peripheral smear but here it is increase for example say 5 6 7% right it will get increase you will have polychromatic rbc because your reticulocyte count is increase if you do the supravital stain for rbc then your retic count can get increase you can demonstrate the increase rating count so these three are the main findings in case of an hemolytic anemia and furthermore according to the type of hemolytic anemia you will see different type of abnormal rbcs like for example spherocytes cystocytes target cell bar cell byte cell and sickle cell they are seen according to the various types of hemolytic anemia okay now i will i will explain some of the mcqs right for your competitive exam it will be helpful for you in the neat exam as well as usmle type of exam so see guys such type of mcqs are being asked in the future this is the future so first mcq is 24 year male patient presented to you with a dyspnea and weakness on investigation hemoglobin level is low 7.2 bilirubin is 2.3 which is obviously increase normal bilirubin is up to 1 so here it is increase ldh is increased markedly which can be the cause of your anemia so guys here the important clue is increase bilirubin and increase ldh whenever these two condition is present obviously it is a case of hemolytic anemia so your answer will be hemolytic anemia okay second mcq a 28 year male patient having the gold stone and weakness complaint his hemoglobin level is low and peripheral smear so lots of target cell and normoblast what could be the probable diagnosis so here two main clue is target cell and normoblast the normoblast is increase in case of an hemolytic anemia so obviously it is a case of hemolytic anemia and you will have increased target cell the increased number of target cell is classically seen in sickle cell and thalassemia right so this is a case of hemolytic anemia particularly most probably thalassemia because target cells are seen so your answer will be thalassemia okay third image patient is having the third mcq the patient is having complaint of fatigue and symptoms aggravated on taking the fava beans peripheral smear finding is attached in the email state your diagnosis so here you can see that your rbc is looks like an broken off right like that of uh, beaten off you can see that rbc looks like an beaten off this is called known by the name byte cell and as we have discussed it is seen in case of an g6pd deficiency so it is your answer will be g6pd deficiency whenever there is oxidative stress the patient will have hemolytic anemia in case of an g6pd deficiency here the oxidative stress is far means right okay fourth mcq which of the following is is incorrect about the extravascular hemolytic anemia serum ldh level is raised splenomegaly can be seen unconjugated bilirubin will be raised so all these three can be seen in case of an extravascular hemolysis right it happen in the spleen so splenomegaly can be present because of broken rbc you can have increased bilirubin level 
and because of destruction in the RBC, LDH level will raise. But hemoglobin urea is not seen in extravascular hemolysis. It is classically seen in intravascular hemolysis. So incorrect statement is presence of hemoglobin urea in extravascular hemolysis. So thank you very much guys. This is all about the hemolytic anemia. If you like my video then subscribe my channel and press the bell icon so that you can get notified whenever I am posting the new video. Thank you very much guys and see you soon in the next video. Take care and be safe.